Snap Judgment Studios. Get a behind-the-scenes look at Comedy Central's The Daily Show on Beyond the Scenes, an original podcast from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Every week, host Roy Wood Jr. goes deeper with notable guests and experts from the Emmy Award-winning series, and together, they use comedy to tackle current topics, from gentrification to gun laws, and take a closer look at how and why these topics matter. Listen to Beyond the Scenes from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Tuesday. Odoo is the most popular open source ERP for many reasons. It's affordable, easy to use. However, most companies rely on Odoo because their applications are fully integrated. But wait, what does fully integrated mean? Imagine a mechanic. They don't waste time running around a shop looking for tools. They keep everything they need in one convenient toolbox. Odoo is just like that. But instead of a hammer or a wrench, you get applications for every aspect of your company. They're always connected and communicating with each other, letting you stay up to date at all times. For a free trial, visit odoo.com slash snap. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash snap. Okay, so fifth grade kitchen table. I tap the napkin with my wand to show Pops my disappearing marble trick. Ta-da! He looks down, frowning. Ta-da! Boy, don't you know it's a battle out there? All this nonsense. Huh? You need to toughen you up. Pop signs me up for the junior football team. And knowing myself like I know me, I'm skeptical. But I see some of my buddies, so I get excited. We all sit on the bleachers and listen to Coach Miles, the giver of lifelong nicknames. Ask Potato Head, Decoy, Gumpy, Buttercup, Weasel. Ask any of the older kids. They will tell you their names were earned on this field. Coach Miles points to me and says, you are a receiver. If you can touch the ball, you can catch the ball. So catch the ball. All right. First scrimmage. First play. Say, hut! I run. Just like Coach Miles screams, cut left in the J formation, and I'm standing there, proud of myself. When the quarterback, Danny Walters, he rears back and launches the football at me. No, 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 oh no, oh no, oh no, no. Then the back of my mind, if you can touch it, you can catch it. You can touch it, you can catch it, you can touch it, you can catch it. I touch it. The ball bounces off my fingers into the air. I stretch almost, fumbling, fumbling, fumbling. And then finally, I get a grip. I pull the ball into my chest and fall down onto the turf. Coach Miles looks at me, trying to remember my name. Hey, hey, you, you. And I know, it's my big chance. Magic. Uh, You can call me Magic. Magic. All right, Magic. Get up and do it again. I get up, but I don't do it again. Two hands, Magic. Wrong way, Magic. He's on your team, Magic. Magic, for the love of God. Coach Miles screams himself hoarse, but I don't care. Because I'm Magic. Magic. At school. What's up, Magic? Hey, Magic. It's the best, the best. And it's not until we move. And I tell all these new kids, hey, you know, you can just, you know, you can just call me, you can call me Magic. Huh? No, no, Magic. I'm I'm Magic. You can just call me that. Hmm. (laughs) It turns out that the one thing I work so hard to get is the one thing that didn't fit in the luggage. Well, today on Snap Judgment, we've got a story about an entirely different type of sport We called it the medicine game, and I can't wait for you to find out why. My name is in Washington. My friends, they call me Magic. At least, you know, they could if they wanted to. Nobody's stopping them when you're listening. To Snap Judgment. We begin. 
again, knowing that sometimes everyone needs a win. So to kick things off, Snap Judgment's Shayna Sheely spoke with Jacelyn Azor. Jacelyn grew up in Aquasasna, Mohawk Nation territory in northern New York, on the border with Canada. This piece does reference words for minorities that one should never, ever use. Sensitive listeners are advised. In middle school, a lot of Jason's friends went to the mostly native school nearby. But instead, Jason's parents sent her to Messina. I just remember my first day, like, it was kind of awkward. Like, natives are the minority there. And I didn't want to be singled out for that. And I didn't want to be, like, looked at funny just because I went to school there or anything. While most kids went to study hall, Jacelyn went to enrichment classes for Native students. And on her way, she heard other kids whispering, calling her SPED for special education. When she'd try to find a seat in the cafeteria, some kids said things like, Oh, there's a Native table. Like, there was a Native table. I think, like, I just kind of put my head down and just kind of, like, tried to tune out whatever they were saying out. And that was just on, like, just being a Native in, in that type of school system. So Jacelyn looked for an escape where she always did. Sports. When she reached 8th grade, she and her younger sister Mimi decided that they'd try out for Messina's lacrosse team. It was a part of me. It was a part of my background, and it was a part of who I was. Jacelyn grew up watching local games on the weekends and hearing from her grandparents about how her ancestors had played lacrosse with the purpose of healing. Lacrosse is the medicine game. A game between the men and the creator, and it was supposed to heal all the sick people in the community, and it's supposed to bring people together. Messina's lacrosse team was a high school varsity level state championship team that had been undefeated since Jacelyn could remember. Jacelyn was just in eighth grade, Mimi in seventh, when they asked the coach for a form to sign up for tryouts. The coach laughed. And that's when she said, like, you're not going to pass the test anyways. Like, I don't even see the point in me trying to give you a paper. I think what, like, pushed us to try to pass was to try to give that, like, metaphoric, like, F you. So every day after school, Jacelyn and her sister practiced stick work outside their house. They did push-ups. They wrapped themselves in trash bags and ran through the snowy woods making their own trails. It was awful, but we knew that um, like it would prepare us for the runs that we had to do. The varsity tryouts were in late winter after school. Jacelyn and Mimi walked from the junior high into the high school locker room. The girls there were taking off their eye makeup. The high schoolers, it was like they were more mature. They are like taller. They just have like this, this aura about them. The girls had to do a timed mile and then vertical jumps. You had to do the pull-up for, I think, 15 seconds. Mm-hmm. And I think that I was so anxious to get that out of the way and get to it that I, hold my, I held myself up for 25. To everyone's surprise, Jason and her sister Mimi passed every part of the test. They made the team at Messina. When they told their dad, he went out and bought them brand new SDX sticks and then poured purple dye into a pot, filled it up with water. And he dipped it in. So half of it was white and half of it was purple. Purple is a very, like, universal color of, like, the Haudenosaunee nations that, like, make up the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Jacelyn and Mimi were the youngest girls on the team. And there was only one other Native girl. All the other girls had red, white, and blue sticks. And so when I, like, brought my stick to Messina, because I knew that, like, my stick stuck out, it was something that I wanted to hold tighter. But it showed, like, a part of who I who I was and, and who I represented. I, and I represented, like, Akwesasne. I represented, like, my people. And Jacelyn and Mimi were good. By mid-season, Jacelyn remembers she and Mimi were on the field almost the entire time. But, like, for us to be able to play at that level at that time, it was just so cool that we were able to do that. But as much as Jacelyn thrived on the field, for some reason, maybe because she and Mimi played so well, Jacelyn noticed that the other girls stopped passing to them. So the sisters started passing to each other instead. 
I were like, all right, you pass to me, I'll pass to you because they're not giving us the ball. I got you and you got me because we know that these girls are gonna treat us a certain way because we play a certain way. The better Jacelyn got, the less she felt like she was part of a team. Um, like I noticed that like we'd only get a good job after games where we were racking up the points and it felt like a little bit used. So she talked to her parents. What if she left Messina? I was worried about like how that would factor into like maybe the college recruiting process. Her parents had sent her there so that she could get into a good college. But she did have another option, Salmon River Middle School. While Salmon, in Jason's words, wasn't as good of a school, it had a lacrosse team. And it was where most of her friends went to school. There was a lot at stake, but... I was just, I was done. I I didn't want to be there. Um, I was going to get my diploma from eighth grade and I was going to go to Salmon. And that was that. Almost as soon as she enrolled at Salmon, Jason heard the rumors that Salmon was going to cut funding for girls lacrosse. The threats came that, oh, like, you're going to lose your season. Salmon's team was in shambles. They didn't have proper jerseys. Most days, just seven or eight girls would show up for practice. Sometimes they'd have to cut practice, or sometimes they had forfeit games because they couldn't get enough girls to commit, or some girls were failing, or or this or that. Like, there was all these factors into this. Giving up lacrosse wasn't an option for Jacelyn, especially when she just gave up an education at Messina. So that summer, Jacelyn and Mimi decided they'd save the Salmon River girls team. They trained girls themselves in their own backyard. They only had a few months of summer to whip the girls lacrosse team into shape. They picked up the phone and made calls to girls at Salmon. Like anyone who was going to try out or wanted to or showed interest of any kind, we were training, we were fundraising, we were going to tournaments. um, Like we, we need all hands on deck. They started out with 13 girls, freshmen, seniors, girls who had never held a lacrosse stick. We were all on different levels. But, like, our intentions to want to play was the same. I mean, we definitely, we were a little rusty. The girls trained in Jason and Mimi's backyard. Their dad ran footwork drills, sprints, stick work, like passing and catching. We were just playing, like, we were just in the backyard again. Like, that was one of the cool things about it. It was just, like, like we were in the backyard again, like, playing for salmon. By the time school started in September, they had 25 girls on the team. Jacelyn showed up with an entire crew of friends, the lacrosse girls. But there was another challenge. The boys at Salmon warned Jacelyn. I was being um, disrespectful and I was this and that, and you guys started to get teased at school. They reminded her that lacrosse was a medicine game reserved for men. The medicine game, it's not supposed to be played by women. Men's lacrosse sticks are so sacred that Mohawk women aren't supposed to even touch them. It brings bad luck to the game. So to this day, like, I haven't touched a wooden lacrosse stick because just to be respectful towards the game, I just, I don't, I I avoid, like, any contact that I would have with one. The thing is, Jacelyn saw her bright sticks and purple dyed nets as a totally different thing than the sacred Mohawk stick. In fact, Jacelyn saw the entire game of girls lacrosse as separate from men's lacrosse. She didn't see it as a medicine game. I think our mentality was we, we were just trying to play. Like, I think that's, that's just like, at the end of it, that's just like what we were trying to do was like, we were just trying to play. And just weeks before the start of Salmon's lacrosse season, the school board superintendent made an announcement. Salmon River lost state aid in the amount of $185,865 out of a total cut to the district in state aid of $6.2 million. We had to make cuts in the athletic budget. We've cut pretty significantly. We're losing several programs. JV softball, JV soccer. You have to make a decision on what to do. Because as of right now, the money wasn't there. Like the superintendent was like, I want to cut this. Like this, this program needs to go because it's taking up time and money. They said that it was just kind of like a loose end program. Girls Varsity Lacrosse came to us at the worst possible time. We want to support the program, but we can't put the money up at this time. I remember leaving, bawling my eyes out because they said that they didn't want to help us. 
we were creating this chemistry as a team and we knew that like we were determined to show everyone that we were we were going to stay here and we were going to save this program the girls kept showing up practicing with one motivation ladies look up there what are we shooting for we're looking for a banner for us right think about that as you go Pick it up, girls. I don't want to see anybody walking. That old man jog, I don't want to see that anymore. Go! Now that they were actually a team, they knew what needed to happen next. Our intention was, yeah, we wanted to kick Messina's ass. Kicking Messina's ass was the one thing all of Salmon River could get behind. Salmon River and Messina had a deep-seated rivalry, though it wasn't a typical high school sports rivalry. And Messina had a headdress on their mascot. Messina's mascot, the Red Raiders, was offensive to the students at Salmon River. But it wasn't just that. During games between the two teams... Like, they call us Redskins, or they call us um, Wagon Burners, or they call us, um, like, they'd say scalp them. But I can't say that, like, every person was like that because not everyone was. It was just the overarching idea that there is this this tension between Messina and Salmon. Jacelyn knew if the girls lacrosse team could beat Messina, the school wouldn't scrap them. Like, this, is, this will change, like, the mindset of our community. It, we just have to prove that. They enrolled their moms in fundraisers. They served dinners almost every week. The moms prepared plates of spaghetti, salads, and brownies, Indian tacos made from fried bread. They went around collecting donations and sold raffle tickets. Because there were a lot of people saying, well, why are, you, why are you trying to help girls play lacrosse? And my mom, and especially all the other moms in the community, did a good job of like letting people know that innocently we just wanted to play. All of the moms were really helpful to us, but the one person that stuck out a lot was Louise. Uh, Louise was one of the mothers on the team, and she's also the clan mother. My saltwater name is Louise Hearn, and I'm a clan mother, bear clan mother for the Mohawk people. And which name do you prefer? Call me Mama Bear. Okay, sorry I've been calling you Louise. That's okay. At first, Mama Bear was not into the idea of girls playing lacrosse. I remember the moment driving in the car with my daughter, Jabu, and said, uh, I want to play lacrosse. And my immediate was, uh, no, girls don't play lacrosse. And she says, well, I'm going to play. I was challenged. I was challenged. And um, especially as a clan mother. A clan mother is a leader nominated by her community. She has the right to call for war, to call for peace. She has her hands in the national treasury. She also is the law, and she also ensures that the culture of the people is carried over. And if there needs to be a change inside the law, she calls for ratification. Mama Bear saw how important lacrosse was to her own daughter. Because she struggles. She, she struggles with her own self-worth and identity and was really going through a crisis in her teen years. When she latched on to the game, I recognized immediately that this was going to be something to help her. What she didn't know was how she could allow for girls to play when it was against the rules. When our children are in trouble, the leaders of a community have to be ready to move mountains and moons and planets in order to help them get better. I, I would have done anything. She read books. She spoke to Native history keepers. I had to sit back and go inside my own culture and say, well, why, why is that? And she found that there actually is a tradition of women participating in the medicine game. The game can't start unless a woman tosses the ball. There's no real evidence of stopping girls from playing lacrosse until you hit the 80s when the when the women actually wanted to formulate a Haudenosaunee team 
And it was at that point in time that other clan mothers started to speak loudly about that narrative that we don't play. And and for me, I was just parroting what I was told. My boys played lacrosse in the minors and never dreamed that any of my daughters, I mean, they figure skated and they played volleyball, but, you know, I never dreamed that they would ever enter the field as a lacrosse player. Mama Bear made one of the toughest decisions of her life to give the girls permission to play lacrosse. You know that it's not going to look favorable in the eyes of the other leaders, but it's okay because it wasn't about me. It was about them girls, and I just stood behind them. Like the other moms, Mama Bear started cooking meals for fundraisers, driving girls to and from practice. And, you know, just being there with blankets when it was freezing cold outside and they were playing and bringing food and snacks. I felt like she just brought such this presence that made me feel like like I was playing a game that was bigger than the game that I was actually playing. Like there was a bigger purpose. In just a few months, the girls and their moms raised enough money for cleats, mouth guards, lacrosse sticks for everybody. The girls practiced in an indoor hockey arena called The Barn. And then, before the season officially started, they played a few scrimmage games with teams outside the region. And they were doing a lot more losing than winning. People are getting tired and people are like, some girls are upset because they're like, we kind of put a lot of time into this, like, why is it not showing? They started blaming one another for the team's failures. Will the girls clean up their act or will tension tear the team apart? Stay tuned. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a mental health professional in your pocket. Talkspace offers both therapy and psychiatry, and being able to reach out to a provider anytime, anywhere, makes addressing mental health super easy, and getting started is the most important part. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code JUDGMENT to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's Judgment and Talkspace.com. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the medicine game episode. My name is Glenn Washington, and after months of fundraising and lacrosse practice, you can cut the tension on the girls' lacrosse team with a spoon. People are getting tired and people are like, some girls are upset because they're like, we kind of put a lot of time into this, like, why is it not showing? They started blaming one another for the team's failures. They started showing up late to practice. I felt like, like I was like, wow, like, is this really what it is, like, after leaving Messina? I wasn't going to let these girls just go halfway, you know, kick open a door and decide they're not going to walk through. Mama Bear led sweat ceremonies to help the girls clear their heads and focus. And she started having one-on-ones with the girls. She told them, View our game the way that our ancestors did. They're not just representing themselves individually, but their families, their communities, their nation and their confederacy and all their ancestors that have passed on. She just had like such this... um this calming voice. Like, look at what you guys have done. It may not show on the scoreboard, but look about, look at what you're doing. You're making your ancestors proud, and you're not only changing the minds of the community, but you're 
giving the next opportunity for girls who may want to play lacrosse. Like you, you have to play with a bigger purpose. Our ability to regroup came from Louise. Mama Bear also set new rules for the girls. The only way that she would allow us to keep playing is if you had a level mind. Like if you ever um, like got upset and you started yelling at people and you started to become a hothead, you had to you had to like calm yourself down and needed to look at it as a way that it was grounding us and the, the way that it was changing us as people. I don't really know how to put into words because it's more of like a feeling and it's more of like a mindset rather than just like saying like, oh, we love each other. It was something that you like almost felt like if you close your eyes, it was just like the flow that everything moved and, the, and their dynamic was very different from other teams. I think after that, we kind of just put our heads down and got to work. The season officially opened in February. The girls played Hoovelton, Potsdam, Canton, and they won each of those games. By March, Jaislyn noticed that there were crowds watching the games. The whole season, like, we had people suddenly wanting to, like, talk about us, like, on the radio, which is really cool. We're talking with the Sam River Girls Varsity uh, Lacrosse team. Hope the school board sees how much this game means to you and that this isn't your last season. Jacelyn Lazor is in ninth grade and Mimi Lazor, she's an eighth grader. Both uh, Jacelyn and Mimi attending Salmon River this year as transfers from a big crosstown rival, Messina Central. You guys are, you, you play so well and you're getting known. We have to prove to them that we came to Salmon to make a difference. We're going to do that. We're going to make a difference. And we had more people in the community that wanted to come to our games just to, like, see the development of, like, where we moved. Even boys from the boys lacrosse team were coming out to watch them play. This is the third straight win for Salmon River. Salmon River pulls ahead versus Potsdam, 11-9. The Lazor sisters tallying nine goals. Marcella Thomas, eight saves. Two more wins this week for Salmon River. Truly an unexpected winning streak. The girls won 14 games in a row. Salmon River girls varsity lacrosse team has made the Section 10 title championship. Guess who their opponent is? Their crosstown rivals, Messina Central. They are the number one team, the Section 10 uh, champions. Let's take some more calls. Caller, are you there? As a Salmon River boy, I used to just despise Messina. They thought they were better than us. Messina, I mean, they're a big town. We don't have that much around here, so it was always us against them. This rivalry has been around for years. Many of us have our own memories of that school rivalry. Go ahead, Caller. I went to Messina. It was a very negative place to go to school because everybody loves the Red Raider. Yes, uh, Deep Messina mascot, uh, the Red Raider. You know, this goes right to the core. Absolutely. To make us a mascot is to dehumanize us as people. Thank you for calling in. Messina, only 10 minutes away, but sometimes it feels like another world. By just qualifying for the Section 10 championship, it was enough to celebrate. But for Jacelyn, the real reason playing the championship was exciting, they were going to play Messina. The match was slated for a warm day at the end of April. So I, the whole school knew about it. So everyone knew how we were doing. So like, oh, we'll be there, we'll be there. When Jacelyn got to school that day, she was a nervous wreck. And it almost felt like, like we were all moving in slow motion. That day I wanted to keep my stick in my locker only because I wanted to make sure like it was close to me all day. Jacelyn braided her hair, grabbed her lacrosse stick, a new one, dyed purple and green for Salmon River colors, and got on the bus. The girls' parents and their bus driver had strung white and green feathers around the outside of their bus. So a lot of us had glitter on our faces. A lot of us had, um, like, black and war paint all over our faces. And a lot of us had the jitters, as if you were going on, like, a really scary um, roller coaster. Like, you're anxious to go, but at the last second, you don't want to go. We're driving to Messina, and I just remember, like, going past the community. And I remember thinking, like, this is going to be huge. Like, this is not... It's not about just this game now. Like, it's about 
us showing them like what we can do, like what we've been working for, like everything, all the time and sweat and tears, like we had, like this is it. This this is what's gonna happen right now. When I play the best is when I think about the people that I'm doing it for, and in that moment, like I knew exactly, like it was for my teammates, and it was for my ancestors. When the girls got to Messina, Jacelyn needed some alone time to focus. I'm gonna put my own headphones in this time. Like I'm not gonna, like really. Like, just listen to anything else. Like, this is what I got to focus on. I was listening to a song called... I'm pretty sure it was one of the songs from A Tribe Called Red. So when I was sitting there and I had my head down, uh, I kept saying, like, I can catch, I can shoot, I can score. I can catch, I can shoot, I can score. The girls started warming up. When Jason saw the Salmon Girls looking over to check out Messina's players. It wasn't about them, it was about us and everything that we needed to prove. So anytime anyone would look over and like, like see what they're doing or how they're shooting or whatever, I was like, no, just don't even look at them. Like this isn't, this isn't us like worrying about them. It's about them worrying about us now. Well, it goes back to those old Cowboys and Indians movies, right? You know, where the Indian is the bad guy and the Cowboy's gonna win, well, you just want to see one movie where the Indian's going to win, right? So, you know, this was the movie. <laughs> Salmon River is just a small country bumpkin school that is 70% native. Going into it, I knew that it was going to be a hard-fought game. And, uh, you know, was in full acceptance, win or lose. You know, we're still going to love our daughters. But I remember just you know, clinging tightly to where I was sitting, to the bleachers. Messina starting off with an early lead. Keep her out, keep her out! Here comes number four for another Raider goal. Watch your back, guy, watch your back! As soon as, it's, as, soon as the first draw happened, um, I think they, they scored on us the first time. And everyone's kind of like shoulders dropped a little bit. You don't really know how to pick yourselves up because you start to doubt yourself. So I just remember like walking over to the D. I'm like, no, it's good. It's good. Like, that's just like, that's just what they do. They're fast. Like, that's what we expected. Like, we know that. The Salmon Girls regrouped. The game was back and forth the whole time. Like the whole game. I just remember like, this is probably like one of the hardest games I've ever played in. The Zor sisters are evening up this game. Nikki, she wants to go right. I think I just I probably made my lip bleed because I was just really clenching my teeth and biting down on my lip. After a while, like we got a little bit sloppy. Messina kept saying like double team, like triple team, like go at her. That like, they started to play sloppy on me. And it was kind of like hacks at me and my sister. I was like limping for a little bit. It got to a point where they actually took me out. 29 will make a shot and it's in and it puts the two Time teams out. neck and neck. Can I get a timeout? The coach pulled her off the field with 15 minutes left in the game. Salmon and Messina were tied, but Jacelyn couldn't run anymore. Jacelyn sipped on her water bottle and watched as Salmon scored another point. They took the lead. We're up by one. And everyone got, since everyone got to a point where they're really high energy, that we were kind of like making fumbles. Like we were throwing the ball away or something or making these passes. Jason finally felt like she could run again. There were three minutes left in the game when Jason stepped onto the field. Like the crowd is just quiet. Like everyone's just quiet. Like no one really knows what to do. If I gave the ball to someone else, I didn't, ex- I didn't know what they would do next. So I was holding the ball for like two minutes. Once again, Jason Lazar with possession, getting swarmed by Messina midfielders. Trying to find a way around, runs into another wall. Okay, he's right. So I move the ball. I send it, I give it to one of our um, our senior uh, midfielders. And she, so she caught the ball. But in that moment, I think her jitters were so high up that she like, she caught it, but it hit off her stick and it fell on the ground. The ball is loose. Nice back Messina now in possession. And then, one of Messina's fastest players, she scooped up the ball and ran it all the way down the field. Messina's player had a clear shot to tie the game. There was no help. 
and I was probably like, I was probably like still 15 yards behind her. And my feet, like, I kind of like stopped because I kind of like expected, my feet kind of like stopped anticipating like, oh, maybe she's gonna score. And the girl came all the way down and she, she took the shot. This, this would have tied the game, right? And like, I just remember our goalie, she made the save and that was it. Literally saved the entire game because she made the save and then the time kind of just like went out and I just like stopped. Salmon River Lady Shamrocks have just knocked off the Messina Red Raiders. They are your 2015 Section 10 champions. I had like this really deep, I was like, oh my God. Like, I feel like I got like punched in the stomach because I was like, oh my God. Like we ran over as a team to the goalie. Like we all jumped on her. And I felt like we we won like the state championship and it, it wasn't even that. Like, and I don't think it had that much to do about the win. Just like, just everything, just just everything, like the electric feeling that I felt in the end, like it, it gives me, it gave me goosebumps. It gave me butterflies. And I just remember like, like just crying. The final score was nine to eight, Salmon River. Like my parents wanted to bring us home. We're like, no, we want to get on the bus. And the reason why was because the whole, the whole time we went all the way back to Salmon on the 20 minute drive, we were just like, screaming, yelling, like chanting, like like just playing music in the back and it was just like I don't know, like I just we I don't know, we were just like yelling outside, we were, we were playing all throughout the town, we turned around and then we went back to Salmon. And um like to have like like a police escort and like the firefighters come out to like kinda escort us. It just it felt really awesome. It wasn't just a regular win. It was like a game played in the sky world and you knew that your ancestors were watching. At the end of the year banquet, the girls were given six inch lacrosse sticks as a trophy. And they put um, SR for Simon River and our numbers and did beadwork all along the lacrosse stick. Wherever I go, I bring it with me, like a necklace that your grandmother gave you or something that holds so much to your heart. It was the first stepping stone that I ever made in my life. And like, what's going to be the next one? What's going to be the one that really brings me to the content moment that I had when I walked off the field with that team, you know? When Jason was younger, she justified playing girls lacrosse by saying it's not a medicine game. The medicine game is the relationship between the men and the creator. Like, that's set in stone. Like, I will never change that. But I think that lacrosse, in general, is a medicine of purpose to me. There's a lot of, like, negative perceptions in the way that people see Native Americans or they think that we're extinct or they think that we're druggies. The promise that I made for myself was, like, that I wasn't going to give up or, like, drop out or drink or smoke or anything, that I was going to stay focused. And that was, like, because... I knew that if I didn't do that, like, how was that really honoring the game? Thank you, thank you, Jacelyn, for sharing your story with the Snap. Jason now plays across for Virginia Tech, and she's in her second year of school there. We first heard about Jason's story from the film Keepers of the Game, which follows the Salmon River Girls lacrosse team during the 2015 season. Big thanks and love to the Halusa Nation, aka a tribe called Red, for letting us use their song Stadium Pow Wow in this story. And big thanks to the film's director, Judd Ehrlich. Some of the audio in this story comes from Keepers of the Game, the documentary, was aired courtesy of the Dick's Sporting Goods Foundation. The original score for this story was by Leon Morimoto. It was produced by Shayna Sheely, with special thanks to Regina Mediaco. It ain't over, Snappers. After the break, we're hitching a ride on the Rhino Rocket. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the medicine game episode. Our next story comes from The Nocturnist, a San Francisco-based medical storytelling live show and podcast where healthcare workers share stories of joy, sorrow, and self-discovery. The storyteller is Dr. Tina Mungel, performed on stage at the Gray Area Theater in San Francisco. It was 9 p.m. on a Tuesday, one of my first overnight calls as a newly minted otolaryngology or ENT resident. I got a frantic call from one of my attendings. Tina, how comfortable do you feel packing a nose? Packing a nose is the ENT term for stopping a nosebleed, or more officially, epistaxis. Actually, epistaxis can range from a drip to a fire hose. And that fire hose can be life-threatening if not turned off quickly. Unfortunately, to that point, my only exposure to epistaxis had been in the form of a practice dummy. So how comfortable did I feel packing a nose? Um, I feel okay. Good, because Dr. Jones is on his way in to the emergency department with a really bad bleed. Whoa, okay. Dr. Jones was not only a physician, but a powerful physician at the hospital where I worked. I need you to do a good job, Tina. (laughs) I'm counting on you. Great, (laughs) okay. So, based on the description over the phone, I decided I'd start with something called a rhino rocket. It's an inflatable balloon that exerts pressure on the bleeding vessel and also has a coating that facilitates platelet aggregation. Sounds great on paper, but I had never used it. (laughs) Time is ticking. Dr. Jones is going to get here any minute, so I had no choice but to consult the ultimate authoritative source, YouTube. (laughs) YouTube is the modern savior of junior surgical residents everywhere. (laughs) Based on this very legit-looking video, I was going to need to soak the balloon in sterile water for 30 seconds, aim for the floor of the nose rather than the brain, which is <laughs> a known possible complication if this procedure is performed incorrectly, inflate the balloon with the patient awake, of course, and hope that this was sufficient to stop the bleeding. So how did I, the kid in school that would glue her hands together instead of the paper during arts and crafts, get here. Medicine versus surgery is often the first question that medical students ask of themselves when deciding a specialty to pursue. Thinking versus doing, brain versus hands, ambiguity versus concreteness. But to me, these opposites felt completely wrong. Otolaryngology is a specialty of the senses, hearing, speech, taste, smell. It is a surgical specialty, yes, but it's so much more than that. It's a specialty that can restore hearing to the deaf, but is it surgical to talk to a patient about a new diagnosis of laryngeal cancer when she depends on her voice for her livelihood and her identity? But these are lofty ideas. Day one of my general surgery rotation as a medical student, I got a very rude awakening. We had a two-handed knot tying assessment and were timed and ranked in comparison to our peers. I came in dead last. Every move was ultra-conscious. Left hand turns inward by pronation. Thumb swings under to form first loop. Left strand crossed over right strand. You get the idea. Okay. The next day was my first real day in the OR as a student. I did the med student dance that you guys might be familiar with, right? Trying not to break the sterile field, trying not to get in the way, nodding emphatically when the attending asks if you can see what he's doing, right? (laughs) All you see is the back of the scrub tech's head. I did that for 18 brutal hours, and then the attending asked me to throw in some buried deep dermals. I had never even heard of the term before, so I asked him to walk me through it. His response was, I want to train people who can look at what I'm doing and just do it. I don't want to have to tell you. Thank goodness for surgical masks. I held back tears and started considering the possibility that my dreams were not enough. Later in the rotation, we had a session on surgical learning, and we're introduced to this concept of the four stages of competence. First, there's unconscious incompetence. (laughs) 
you're terrible, and you don't even know how terrible you really are. <laughs> Next, there's conscious incompetence. Now you know you suck. <laughs> Third, conscious competence. You finally kind of know how to do something, but it takes immense concentration. And fourth, unconscious competence. The skill is second nature, like driving someplace and not remembering how you even got there. That's the very definition of a comfort zone. That was a huge lipo moment for me, honestly, because as a third year med student, I basically always sucked, or at best, sucked a little less. <laughs> and yet, I compared myself to this standard of effortless expertise, berating myself that I wasn't already there. By the end of the rotation, after immense deliberate practice, I went from being dead last in the knot tying assessment to being amongst the fastest in my cohort. On the very last day, the chief said to me, you get surgery. I hope you choose this specialty. And so I did. I chose otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and it chose me back. Since starting residency, the obstacles have taken on a somewhat different face. I look a little different, for example. I'm the only woman in my class, absolutely no women in the class above me. I happen also to be a woman of color with kind of a baby face. I've had patients question my ability to perform their procedure without knowing anything about me except how I look and at most my name. Shouldn't you be in school, young lady? Where's my doctor? Surprise, it's me. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> I still have those nights where I go home and wonder, am I even doing this right? Early in residency, I was given the feedback that I needed to be more efficient, go figure, on the surgical ward so that I could spend more time in the operating room. Flash forward some time from that feedback, I was rounding in the room of a patient. The seniors congratulated this patient that it was his last day in the hospital after a several month long, excruciatingly difficult admission. They then left the room, went to the neighbor's room, leaving me to finish up. As I was wrapping his wounds for what was supposed to be the last time in the hospital for this gentleman, my eyes were drawn to the monitor on the wall. His oxygen saturation was drifting slowly down. No alarm was going off, just a steady flashing blue light, 88%. An hour later, the stat chest CT showed multiple massive pulmonary emboli, or clots in the lungs. If he had been discharged that day, he could have died at home. In other words, if I had been more efficient, he could have died at home. Back in the emergency department, Dr. Jones rolls in on a gurney, accompanied by his wife. He's holding a blood-soaked wad of tissues to his face. There's a saying in medicine, see one, do one, teach one. But nobody talks about the quantum leap between seeing and doing. You never want to admit, this is that one I'm about to do. <laughs> I take the wad of tissues off his face, and sure enough, there's a steady, pulsatile stream of bright red blood coming from the left nostril. He's pale, his heart is racing, and there's a huge clot in his throat, confirming he's lost a lot of blood already. I walk him to the plan, partly for my own sake, and follow the steps from memory. One, soak balloon. Two, follow the floor. Three, inflate balloon. Four, pray. <laughs> and so we waited. 10 minutes later, there's no more blood. 30 minutes later, still nothing. Not sure who was more surprised in that moment. <laughs> the patient slash doctor or me. I admitted him for overnight observation, and the next day he had surgery to definitively ligate the offending artery. Since then, I've packed dozens of noses, but there's a first for everything, and that was quite the first. Where we stand in the stages of competence as trainees, where we should stand, and maybe most important of all, where we think we should stand, these are not objective facts. I know now I linger longer in the conscious struggle. If I could, I would add another stage of competence between steps three and four. It's called just outside the comfort zone. Comfort, if obtained too early, leads to complacency. Don't get me wrong, I want to be really good at what I do, just not take it for granted. I want to use humility to my advantage to remind, to, to remind myself 
there's always more to learn. There are always ways to do better. And so for now, I think I'd rather stay just outside the comfort zone. I might be a better surgeon that way. Thank you. That was Dr. Tina Munjal, an ear, nose, and throat doctor speaking on stage at The Nocturnist, a San Francisco-based medical storytelling live show and podcast created and hosted by the physician Emily Silverman. To find out more stories from the world of medicine, check out The Nocturnist wherever you get your podcast, or visit their website, thenocturnist.com. Oh yes, somehow, some way, it happened again. If you missed even a moment, know this. You're one of us now. Stories make your world better. And there are so many more stories where this came from. Along with a community that loves those stories. Be a snapper. Subscribe to the Snap Judgment Podcast because it might just change your life. If you love snap storytelling, storytelling made from the heart, the mind, and the soul, support it. Patreon.com slash Snap Judgment. Be part of the league of the world's most amazing people that keep Snap running. Patreon.com slash Snap Judgment. The best way to listen to Snap is while wearing Snap stuff. T-shirts, pins available right now at the Snap Judgment Studio shop. Fly your Snap flag high. Snapjudgment.org. Snap is brought to you by the team that would never, ever bet real money on a kid's sporting event. No way! Except, of course, for the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich. When Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. Anna Sussman, Shayna Sheely, Marissa Dodge, Pat Masini Miller, Renzo Gorio, John Facile, Nika Singh, Teo Ducat, Leon Morimoto, Flo Wiley, Nancy Lopez, and Regina Bediaco. Well, this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you'd cross the big goal line with the ball to hear the crowd roar, only to realize. It's the other team smiling, and this does not look like your side of the field. To do all that, and you would still, still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is PRX. If you run your own company, then you need Odoo. Odoo is an affordable all-in-one management software built to increase the efficiency and productivity of any business, regardless of size, budget, or industry. With Odoo's massive library of fully integrated applications, you can control every aspect of your company from anywhere, at any time. So ditch that old, outdated software and get more done in less time with Odoo. For a free trial, go to odoo.com slash snap. That's O. D-O-O dot com slash snap.